Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this Bible study. I thank you for all these, my brothers and sisters, who are so much interested in the study of the Word of God because they realize it is the study of the Word that strengthens the believer. It is the study of the Word that will keep our feet in the path of righteousness. It is the study of the Scriptures that will confirm our hope, our faith in the Lord. Father, we thank you. Because you have not left us without instruction, without guidance, without teaching and doctrine in this church. We thank you for the encouragement we receive as we all run and we come so that we can actually take in the word of God. We pray, oh Lord, that this quality of life you have given us in a church like this will remain with us ever until we see the Lord in Jesus' name. We thank you for what we have learned in the past. We thank you for the effect of what we learned in our lives in the past. We thank you because this is the point you have led us to by the strengthening, the instruction in your word. We pray that you lead us on. That you continue to teach us. And that we will not be ignorant of your will, of your word, of your way that we need to walk in. We pray, Lord, that as we come to the study today, you will teach us in a very definite way. And I pray that the Spirit of God will apply the word to the heart of everyone, even beyond what we can say, what we can verbalize. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of the living God will apply all this word into every area of our lives so that we'll become better Christians stronger Christians that will be firm in our faith and will be able to follow the Lord without looking back. Teach us today, O Lord. We expose ourselves to you and we pray, O Lord, that you will guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we come together to continue our study. This new year we started the study of a new book. And it is the book of Exodus. If you were here last week, we had study one. And we started with chapter one. Before starting with chapter one last week, I introduced the whole book. And I told you that the book is concerned with the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt. Or it is concerned with redemption. And I told you that the first part of the book dealt with the need of redemption. You'll find that in the life of human beings too. That there is the need for redemption. I then told you that you go from the need for redemption, you go to the might, the power of the Redeemer. And this is what you'll find as we study on. That God has provided for us a deliverer, a savior a redeemer, and is mighty to save, is strong in strength. Not only that we have the need for redemption, not only that we have the might of the redeemer, we also have the duty of the redeemed. We have the nature of the, red of the redemption as well. The nature is that the character of the redemption is that we are purchased by the blood, the blood of the Lamb. And you know that Jesus Christ is our only Savior. And he has given his blood so that we can be redeemed from the nature or the character of redemption. We see our duty. Because the duty is there to worship. The duty is there that we are to serve God and we are to be obedient to the word of God. So then, you will find that as we go on in this book, we have a lot to learn. I, I just want to remind you now the condition in which the children of Israel found themselves after the death of Joseph. You remember the story that Joseph was sold into Egypt. But it was part of God's plan. Eventually that man, Joseph, became a very important figure like a prime minister in Egypt. Then he sent to his father Jacob and to the sons of Jacob. Jacob checked up from God and God permitted him and said, go there. 
There I will make you to become a great nation. We learned last week that if we're going to take any step, you want to travel somewhere, you want to change location, you want to make any move, it will be good like Jacob, that we talk to the Lord. His son might be inviting us. There may be plenty of food and plenty of sustenance in that other place. But apart from all that, still make sure that you pray and you know the will of God, you know the leading of God that you are to go there. Eventually they settled in Egypt. And then Israel began to multiply. What we learn is that in verse 8, chapter 1, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. From that point, things began to change. Let us know that no condition is permanent. Never forsake God, because a new king may arise, a new manager may arise, a new head may arise that knew not Joseph. And therefore, we all need at all times to put our faith in God. Now, this new king that arose and knew not Joseph decided that he was going to have a kind of plan to deal with the children of Israel. Still in chapter 1, verse 11, Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. Remember that when Jacob and the children, when they came into Egypt, it was not on the point of slavery. It was just that God had promoted their son, the son of Jacob, that is Joseph, to a high position. And they came as free people. And then the king at that time gave them the part of the land which was Goshen, to be living there. But now they had worked out everything in the process of time that they now made slaves out of them. Let us understand this why we need to really talk to the Lord before we get to a particular place. And now they appointed taskmasters over them. They gave them jobs to do now and they told them what to build in verse 12. And the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Affliction was now increasing, rising up. In verse 12, latter part, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. That is, the Egyptians were unhappy. They were grieved that these Israelites were becoming more in number. Not only that, they were becoming stronger. In verse 13, and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. Oppression had come. Affliction had come. Verse 14, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. In mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their services wherein they made them to serve was with rigor. But that was not sufficient for the new king that rose up in Egypt. He also wanted to weaken them so that they'll never be able to get strong enough. They'll never be able to form an army. They'll never be able to run out of Egypt. All this is showing us the secret plan of the devil. The secret plan of the enemy to so weaken the people of God. That the purpose of God will not be fulfilled according to their plan. And so you find in verse 16, and he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, he shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then shall she live. The plan, as I told you last week, was that all the male children will be killed. And then the daughters will be saved or spared. When the old people are getting older and they are dying, the young generation of the Israelites that will be able to grow up will only be ladies, will only be women. And because of that, all these women now, since there will be no man in Israel of their age, they will be married into Egypt, amalgamated with the Egyptian population. That was his plan. So that the plan of God, the promise of God to Abraham, the covenant of God with Abraham will not be fulfilled. But you see, man proposes. Yes, you know, God disposes. In verse 22, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born, ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Pharaoh eventually decided that this was not to be a private plot. It was not to be public. And told all his people that the children of Israel, as they were getting pregnant, 
they would uh, be watching them. If they gave birth to baby boys, they'll kill them. Throw them into the river. And if they were girls, they'll be saved alive. Let's learn something before we look at the study today. With such an edict that every male child be drowned, the enemy thought that the extinction of Israel was very certain. The enemy planned and felt that this plan, nobody would be able to escape this. Since all the people were commissioned to assist in this evil design, and there was no human means of resistance on the part of Israel, how could Israel survive as a nation? When it appears there is no way for man, God always has a way. Remember that in your family. Let's remember that in this church. That when it appears there is no way of escape, escape from trial, escape from affliction, escape from oppression, escape from persecution, escape from difficulties that may be leveled or targeted against the whole church, against the whole family, and the enemy will feel that there is no way of escape. How could that church, how could that nation, how could that family survive? Let's always remember there is still a way with God. But notice this. Canal reasoning, unbelief, and fear might have led the Israelitish families to avoid pregnancy at such a time. You see, husbands and wives could have been discussing together, saying, what's the use? If the woman will carry this pregnancy for nine months, and at the end of it, a boy comes up, and the boy is going to be thrown into the river. In fact, if it's a girl, do we want to be bringing up girls that Egyptians eventually will get married to and assimilate into the Egyptian population? Canal reason then might say, there's no use of getting pregnant. Therefore, we're going to avoid pregnancy. Let us be very careful of canal reasoning. You see, there are sometimes we have difficulties in the nation, like in our nation here, to be very sincere, you know the difficulties we have the economy, and a lot of other things we can think about. But then let us be careful that we're not because of that living in fear, worry, and anxiety, kind of reasoning, and unbelief. Let us still walk by faith. Not only that, you see some canal on scriptural advisors might even have discouraged the young Israelites from getting married because of the edict of the new king, who knew not Joseph. These advisors might say, young people, don't think about marriage now. Because if you get married, you're going to be thinking of having children. And if you have boys as your first child, if you have boys in the family, they're going to throw into the river. Let us be careful that we're not changing the doctrine of the Bible. Because of circumstances. You see, there are some churches, they change their doctrines. They change their practice. Because of the prevailing conditions in their country or in their community. Not only that, there might have been some people that will say, let's do something. We must do something about this. This kind of edict, this kind of law will not have been there and will not come up at all if we have somebody in politics. If we have somebody that will be able to defend us and fight for us, that before the edicts come out, we'll have an Israelite right there in the palace, right there in the siege of government, that will be able to cancel that thing. And therefore, instead of doing what the Lord wanted them to do, all they'll be doing was to go about, to make sure that they appoint a political leader of their own. You see, in this condition in which we live in our country now, that's an obvious danger that because, you know, there have been things that obviously we're not happy with and we want everything to change, instead of praying, instead of looking up to God, instead of handing over everything unto God, there are churches and religious groups that will feel that we should forget about evangelization now. We should forget about doctrinal teaching now. We should forget about every other thing now. What we need with all these edicts and with all these conditions is to come together and have the choice of a political leader. But the children of Israel did nothing like that. But didn't God fulfill his purpose? Oh yes, he did. How could a deliverer arise? How could a redeemer arise? How could the children of Israel get out of uh, Egypt with such a difficult situation at that time? That leads us to what we're studying today. We come to chapter 2. The birth of the deliverer. Not only is birth, is preservation. 
because it was at such a time when boys were being thrown into the river that the deliverer Moses was born. So we have the birth, we have the preservation. In fact, we have the deliverance of the deliverer himself. That's the title of what we're studying today from Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 25. We're studying about the deliverance of the deliverer. I've broken the chapter into three parts. Part 1, the birth and preservation of Moses. Part 2, Moses' premature action before God's appointed time. Part 3, 40 years separation from God's people. As we look at point 1, or part 1, we're going to read Exodus chapter 2. Open your Bible with me, please. Exodus chapter 2, from verse 1. And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, he hid, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and dubbed it with slime and with peach, and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flax by the river's brink. And a sister stood afar off to which to know what will be done to him. Let's stop there for a moment. Here we find a Levite, a man, marrying to a Levite, a woman. You see, they married in the same tribe. They were children of Israel, and even in the same tribes together. Here we learn that whatever the condition, we should be very careful that we do not allow the conditions to lead us to carnal reasoning. Do you know at this time, all the children of Israel were rendered poor. And then the Egyptians were rich. All the children of Israel were rendered as slaves. But the Egyptians were like the masters. All the Israelites were serving like this man that married. He will be serving with rigor. And yet, this woman married him. Because it is still better to marry a poor Christian than a rich Egyptian. To marry a slave Israelite than marrying a master that is an Egyptian. It is better to marry among the oppressed people of God. Don't look at the oppression. Don't look at the affliction. Look at the fact that this is a child of God. Because there is a wonderful future and hope for the believer, rather than for the unbeliever, for the one in the world. And so let us remember that in this condition of poverty, this condition of joblessness, we do not allow the condition to make us to go and marry an Egyptian, or to go and marry from the unbelievers, still be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, what relationship, what communion, what concord, what agreement as the temple of God with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will walk in them and live in them. Therefore come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And God says, I will receive you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore are people, young people, brothers and sisters, who have not got married, remember, whatever the condition in the country, whatever the joblessness, whatever the affliction, whatever the persecution, let us make sure we're not going to marry among the unbelievers, we're going to marry among the people of God. The woman conceived, and when she conceived, she bare a son. When she conceived, she bare a son. As she bore this son, remember the edict. Remember, every son that is born, the new king had commanded all his people they will throw into the river. Immediately they saw the danger. Oh yes, there was danger. But thank God, these people, the husband and the, uh, and the wife, they had faith. Let's look at what the New Testament says about this couple, this family. In Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse, 20, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because he saw that he was a proper child. 
and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. Here we learn that Moses was seen those three months on what basis? By faith. By faith. They did not allow the conditions, the prevailing conditions to allow, to make them worry, to make them to be anxious, to make them to be fearful, and to make them to be carnal, to make them unscriptural. They still lived by faith. Now when it says by faith, what faith? Because the Bible tells us how faith comes. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. What word of God would they have heard? Well, God has spoken to J Jacob saying, Go down to Egypt, I will bring you out. Go down to Egypt, I'll be with you there. I'll make you a great nation there, and I will bring you out. They depended upon that word, and that word generated faith in their heart. Not only that, the word of Joseph. Because Joseph himself has said, if you look at Genesis chapter 50 and verse 24, this says the very last word of uh, Joseph unto the people. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you. And bring you out of this land unto the land, which is swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And so you will see that they had heard the word of God. That's why we encourage ourselves, let us hear the word of God. It may be a statement, a sentence. It may be a particular verse, a particular chapter. Do not miss learning the word of God. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The Levite and the wife had known the word of God from Jacob, from Joseph, that they will not perish in that place, no matter their affliction, God was surely going to visit them and bring them out. And so, by faith, when this child was born, there was also the communication of God with their heart. They knew that this child was not just an ordinary child, a goodly child, a special child, a peculiar child, and therefore they hid this child for three months. For three months because of the faith in them. Moses was born at such a dangerous oppressive period in Egypt. The cruelty of Pharaoh against Israel had risen to the highest point and little did Egypt know that God could raise up a deliverer at such a time. The life of Moses was in danger because of the royal proclamation. God can always raise up a great deliverer from a poor family, in an oppressed nation, in the most perilous circumstances. We thank God because of the faith of these parents. But this was not passive faith, quiet faith, silent faith, inactive faith. You see, there are people that will say they have faith, but then the faith is not active. Faith always results in action, even when the action may be risky. Have you thought about how risky it might have been for these parents to have hidden that child Moses for three months, yet faith will not think about the risk? Living by faith, the, mo the mother also displayed wisdom. Faith can be exercised in our lives. When we talk of faith, it's not only in healing we demonstrate faith, not only in salvation, not only in receiving answers to specific prayer requests, but when we live without fear, under a perplexing, paralyzing edict, that is faith. In your place of work, there might be a law against Christian dressing. Can you live by faith? In your place of work, there might be an edict, a law, against people that study the Bible, that are going to live by the principle of righteousness. In such a perplexing, paralyzing situation, can you live by faith? It may even be that there may be some kind of commands or some kind of edict or some kind of decree in any nation. And in that nation, you might be living there. Do you realize that even in that perplexing, paralyzing situation in such a country, that children of God were not to live under fear, worry, and anxiety, not knowing what will happen, and to live in insecurity without any kind of protection on us, we still live by faith. It was faith that made Moses' parents to defy the king's command. Faith overcame the fear of the king and trusted in God's protection. And yet, we need to learn something here. The faith also worked along with wisdom. Through faith, 
the vanquished fear. Yet the mother hid the child, and later kept the child in the ark. It is not faith but fanaticism, which deliberately exposes oneself to danger. You see the child now, at the age of three months, would cry more, and will move more. And it appeared that will be known now to uh, people around, and the child could not be hidden anymore. And faith now connected or God combined with wisdom. Faith in God acts wisely to avoid danger by legitimate precautions. You see, Jesus Christ, there were times he withdrew himself from the crowd, from the mob. When he knew that the Pharisees were getting furious and the Pharisees were watching for him, he will draw himself. And that's the wisdom we ought to have. Faith, oh yes, wisdom as well. We also learned that civil authorities are to be defied and disobeyed when their commandments or their decrees or their edicts are contrary to the expressed mind, will, and word of God. You see what these parents did? They defied the king's commandment. Because the king's commandment that said they should allow their children to be thrown into the river, that was contrary to the will of God. Thou shalt not kill. And because of that, they disobeyed the king's commandment. It was contrary to the law of God. And God is the king of kings and the lord of lords. And if the commandment of man contradicts that of God, we rather obey God rather than man. Now, you will see that as the child was put at the river's brink, can we say something about that? That you see, where is the last place you will ever think about putting the child? You will not want to bring the child near the river because this was the very place where the children were being drowned. What would have done in our own human reasoning is to take the child, is to go and hide the child far, far away from a, a place that is far away from the river, at the very brink of the river that these people, these little children, were being drowned, is where the child was kept. Well, she must have been led by God. She must have been directed by God. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 2, from verse 5. And a daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and she be, and behold, the babe wept. And when and she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go? And call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, and she, that she may nurse the child for thee. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away, and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. I do not want us to hurriedly pass over these verses of Scripture, because these verses of Scripture are full of meaning. I pray God will open your eyes to see. I pray that through these things that we study and point out here, your faith will grow in Jesus' name. I want you to realize that nothing happened by chance or by accident here. Let me first of all tell you uh, some things on these verses of scripture. The child Moses had been put in an ark of bulrushes. It had been welled up so that water will not come in. You see how faith worked with wisdom. You see how faith worked with industry. Industry, that means uh, working hard. You see how faith was not lazy. You see how faith did not just say, well, God will protect the child. And faith actually worked. Faith without works is dead. Faith without corresponding action is dead. 
And so this woman actually had to, you know, cut some of these uh, stalks of bulrushes, put them, weave everything together, and put with slime and peach, put the child carefully inside, cover it up so that the insects around the river brink will not trouble the child. You see how faith works. Faith, wisdom, hard work, industry, that will apply everything you know, and yet you are still trusting in God. A kind of a person that will just fold his hands and say, well, I'll not do anything. I'll not act in any way. But I'm believing God. A person that is out of job. I'll not try to application. I will not even look for work. I'm believing God. No, that is not how to believe in God. There is faith combined with the wisdom, combined with the, with the willingness to work, combined with the hard work. And eventually the child was put there. Think about this. That Pharaoh's daughter came. Before the child actually became hungry. Can you see the act of God in that? Not only that, Pharaoh's daughter came to the very spot near the place where the child had been put. Oh, Pharaoh's daughter could have gone to another place to take her bath. Pharaoh's daughter could have gone to a place that is so far away that the maids of Pharaoh's daughter would not have seen the child. Can you see the actions of God? Not only that, immediately, when he took that uh, ark and opened it and saw a child, immediately that child cried. Can you see how God worked with everything? And then Pharaoh's daughter had compassion. Pharaoh's daughter could have been furious. Pharaoh's daughter could have said, this is one of the Hebrew boys and my father said, kill them, throw them, and I am going to obey my father. I am going to do what my father said everybody should do. And I'm going back home to tell my daddy how I saw one of the Hebrew sons and I threw that son into the river. But, you know, God so worked about everything that, the Pharaoh, that Pharaoh's daughter had compassion immediately. Miriam came, the sister to this uh, little boy, and said, Can I go and get a nurse for you? Now this is a young girl. The wisdom that God put the words in the mouth of that, of that girl at that time. Can you see God at work? And can you see that the maids of, daughters of the daughter of Pharaoh never asked any question? Never pushed her away. Who invited you to come? Who told you to come and say anything here? They never said that. Because these maids were surrounding Pharaoh's daughter for her security, for her protection. If he came there to take her bath, they didn't want anybody uh, waiting around to be looking at her while she was taking her bath. And yet, they never asked any question. Shall I go and call a, a somebody to come and nurse the child for you? Even Pharaoh's daughter did not say, did you know how the child got here? What are you doing all alone, you young girl, by yourself here? Are you watching over the girl? Do you know the mother of the, child? No, of the child? No question at all. Can you see the hand of God in that? God preserved Moses. You see, they had manifested faith. Now I'm sure of this. I'm very sure of this. And you'll be sure if you are real, if you are a father or you are a mother. I'm sure that daddy and mommy for Moses, they were praying at home. They had put this child here and they were still continuing in prayer. Oh God, we trust you. This goodly child will not die like this. And we'll put Miriam there. Oh Lord, whatever happens, help Miriam to be able to say the right word at the right time to the right person for the preservation of the life of the child. Can you see how God worked through everything? Eventually, the mother of Moses was called to take care of the child. And when she, when she came, now if you look at the daughter, Miriam, and the mother, you might see some resemblance on their faces. And yet, the daughter of Pharaoh never asked a question, is this not your mother? Oh, you said you are going to call a nurse. Is this the person you have gone to call? It looks like uh, this is your mother. Not only that, we are adults. If you see a woman that has just given birth to a baby three months ago, as you look at the woman, from, you know, from the look of the woman, you are likely to say, after all, Pharaoh's daughter was a lady herself. And she should have known that this woman had just given birth to a baby. And the woman, the, the daughter's Pharaoh should have been asking, do you know anything about this baby here? It looks like you have just given birth to yourself. Not a single question asked. We give all the glory to God. God is a great God. God is a mighty God that he knows when he can silence the enemy. 
He knows when the enemies ought not to ask any single question. He knows when everything and how everything ought to go according to his purpose. This is why we worship God. This is why we glorify God. Because God is able to order every detail of your life to his own glory. God knows what he wants to do. And he's going to do it at his own time. God ordered every detail for his own glory in this case. In fact, look at this. That as the mother came, Pharaoh's daughter said, I'm going to pay you for what you are doing. Do you realize that this uh, uh, Pharaoh's uh, daughter is going to take money from Pharaoh? Is going, to take, is going to be getting money from her father to be able to take care of this child? This is the wisdom of God. Some of Pharaoh's money was spent to pay. The Hebrew mother, that is her own, his own mother, to nurse her own child. Pharaoh proposed to deal wisely with the children of Israel, try, planning to weaken them, to oppress them, to destroy them, to kill them, so they will not become a nation that will be strong and mighty enough to get out of Egypt. Yet in the end, yet in the end, God supernaturally, in his wisdom, compelled Pharaoh to give birth, lodging, and education to the very man who accomplished the very thing that Pharaoh was trying to prevent. Great is the wisdom of God. In fact, Pharaoh's wisdom was turned to foolishness and Satan's devices were defeated. Now, we learn that God is able to protect his own. And I believe he will continue to protect his own. But then before we leave that uh, point, let us see about this Moses. What learning did he have? Eventually, because we are told when he became of some age, when he could now be handed over to Pharaoh's daughter. He was handed to Pharaoh's daughter. What happened after he was handed to Pharaoh's daughter? We go to Acts chapter 7. From verse 18. Acts chapter 7 from verse 18. Till another king arose. Which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly. Cleverly. Craftily. With our kindred. And evil entreated our fathers. So that they cast out their young children. To the end they might not live. In which time Moses was born. And was exceeding fear. And nourished up. In his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Which means that actually he was given wonderful education. He was given the best education that anybody in Egypt could have. God prepared all that because, you know, God used Moses to write Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He was educated. How did God do all that with the money of Egypt? He used part of it to educate him so that he would know how to write. He would know how to organize. He would know how to do a lot of things. Well, that shouldn't surprise us. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And all that God used still belonged to him. Even though Pharaoh kept those things, the finance, the wealth, and the money, it belongs to God, and God used it to raise up a deliverer for his own people, the children of Israel. Now, we learn wonderful lessons here. And these lessons we find in Isaiah, for example, Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43 from verse 1. But now thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burnt. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom. Oh yes, he did. And Ethiopia and Sheba for thee. And so, whatever may be the prevailing conditions around you as an individual, 
around your family, maybe coming from the village or around the church, we should understand that it is the will of God that eventually will be done. What are we to do? We are to keep on walking by faith and not by sight. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Let us get encouragement from the mother and the father of Moses. Walking by faith and not by sight. It wasn't only the father that walked by faith. It wasn't only the mother that walked by faith. Hebrews where we read before has told us the parents walked by faith. The parents hid him because they had faith in God. Walking by faith. Let's understand whatever edict, whatever decree, whatever commandment, whatever conditions, whatever the economy in our country, we as children of God, we can keep on walking by faith. Walking by faith. In Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. Reading from verse 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. There were many devices in the heart of Pharaoh that a deliverer will not come, that these people will never leave the land of Egypt, that all their male boys will be killed and destroyed. There are many devices in a man's heart, many, many devices we cannot tell. The multitudes of plans we cannot tell. The many devices in the hearts of wicked men. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand your father-in-law may have some devices nevertheless the counsel of the lord that shall stand your teacher at school may have some devices nevertheless the counsel of the lord that shall stand enemy of righteousness enemy of progress in your life may have devices nevertheless the counsel of the lord that shall stand Whatever wicked men have at heart, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. In Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 30. There is no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel against the Lord. When God plans something, there's no counsel, no understanding, no wisdom. There's no plan of the enemy that will be able to defeat and destroy what God has planned. You know God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your career. He has a plan for your marriage. He has a plan for you working for him. He has a plan for you evangelizing. He has a plan for you in the kingdom of God that you need to fit into. Oh, you say, but I have so much opposition, so much affliction, and so much a family problem, and I have so much difficulty, and I have so much need, and there's so much poverty, and there's, there's so much bragging of the enemy saying that I will not be able to serve the Lord. Well, there are many devices in the heart of men that may be leveled against you, but the plan of God, the counsel of the Lord, the will of God, that shall stand. It will stand. Now, today we, we have started looking at the remarkable life of this great man of God, Moses. And it's a lot for us to learn, a lot for us to point out. And of course, as we continue our study of Exodus, there are many things we're going to see. We're going to learn concerning Moses. Let me just tell you this, that Moses presents a series of striking contrasts, striking antithesis, which means there are some things that look almost contradictory, almost opposite that you find in his life. I didn't say sinful. I said contradictory. Let me tell you what I mean. He was a, the child of a slave and the son of a queen. He was born in a hut, but he lived in a palace. He inherited poverty by birth, but he enjoyed unlimited wealth. He was keeper of flocks in later part of his life, and he became eventually the leader of armies. He was the mightiest of warriors and the meekest of men. He was educated in the court, and then he dwelt in the desert. He had the wisdom of Egypt for the faith of Abraham's seed. He was brought up in the city, but he wandered in the wilderness. He was raised in luxury and comfort, but then you know he endured hardship willingly. He was backward in speech, that he couldn't talk well, and yet he talked with God. He had the rod of a shepherd, 
but he had the power of the infinite. He was a fugitive running away from Pharaoh, but then he became an ambassador from heaven. He was the giver of the law and the forerunner of grace. He died alone on Mount Moab. Then later he appeared with Christ on another mountain in Judea. No man assisted in his burial, yet God buried him. We need to study about such a man like this. About the call of God on his life. About the ministry that God gave unto him. About his helping and acting as deliverer, redeemer for the children of Israel. About his even representing prototype. It's representing as a type of Jesus Christ before Jesus came. And how God used that man mightily. It's something that will furnish us with great, great, great depth of study. And by the grace of God in weeks to come. This is what we're going to discover in our study of Exodus. Now let's go to point two. You've seen the birth of Moses. You've seen the preservation of his life. You've seen his early childhood. You've seen his early training. Now we come to point two. Moses' premature action. Before God's appointed time. We go back to Exodus chapter two. Exodus chapter two. I'm reading from verse 11. As I read, I'll pass comments uh, so as to interpret and explain and apply for you to get the rich blessings in the passages we're studying. Verse 11 of Exodus chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days, when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren, and looked on their burdens, and espied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren, twelve, and he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian, the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said unto him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me, as thou killed the Egyptian? And Moses feared, and said, Surely this thing is known. Verse 15, Now when Pharaoh had this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh, and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Come back to verse 11. It says, it came to pass in those days that Moses was grown. Moses was now grown up. And as we read later, I'll show it to you in the Acts of the Apostles, he was now 40 years of age. And he now went out to see his brethren and to look upon their, bread, upon their bodies. This was a good quality in his life. In the palace, there was luxury. There was comfort. There was convenience. There were provisions. There was education, education opportunities for him in the palace. But his heart never forgot the need and the burden of his people. Let's remember, whatever promotion we have, whatever opportunities we have, whatever privileges we have in our place of work or in our families, let us not forget we are part of the people of God. And you will want to associate with the people of God. And so in verse 12, he looked this way and that way when he saw an Egyptian smiting an Israelite looking this way and that way. What does that mean? He was watching to see that nobody will see him, what he wanted to do. Because he planned to kill the Egyptian, he was walking by sight. That is symbolized by looking this way, looking that way before doing something. He knew that what he wanted to do will not be approved by Egypt. He knew that this would be wrong. But then he still did it. He went ahead and he killed the Egyptian. And then he hid him in the sand. Which means that he was hiding. He knew that what he did was not the proper thing. You see, there are times that people will look this way and that way. And will do something. And what you do, you have to hide in the sand so that nobody will see. Could he hide it? Was, it, was, it, was that thing really hidden? Then the following day, he went out again. And he saw now two Hebrew men striving together. 
Let me talk about that for a moment. It's unfortunate that these two Hebrew people were striving together. They are the common master, common taskmasters, common enemy, striving and living under a common problem, and yet they strove together. Isn't that an illustration sometimes in the church of the living God? We have a common enemy, the devil. A common persecution because of righteousness. And we have common problems, maybe of poverty or whatever. And yet to find that we as Christians, as the people of God, we can still strive together. Quite unfortunate. And so Moses saw this unfortunate situation. And he said, Wherefore smitest thy fellow? Why, you are brethren? Don't you understand that we are suffering together under a common taskmaster? And then the one that did the wrong said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Who has appointed you? I don't recognize your calling. I don't see that you are going to do anything. I don't accept that you are a prince or a judge. Now the people that do wrong, that's the way they always act. That's what they always do. The people that do wrong, they don't want correction. And they don't want anybody to say, that is not right. Don't oppress your fellow. Don't oppress your business partner. Don't oppress your wife. And don't rebel against your husband. They don't want it. Who made thee a counselor? Who made you my teacher? Who made you my pastor? Who made you a person to be looking at every detail of what I do? Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Then he said something. Do you want to kill me? As you killed that Egyptian yesterday. Oh yes, we know about it. And Moses feared. And he said, surely this thing is known. And then in verse 15, eventually Pharaoh heard about this. And he was looking and searching for Moses. He wanted to kill him. And Moses now fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. Well, all these things were blunt now. We can sum up in one single word. Impatience. Being in a hurry. Doing something prematurely before the appointed time of God. One word, impatience. Let's go to... Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. It says the same thing, but it just throws light on how old this man, Moses, was at that time. Exodus, chapter 7, reading from verse 23. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, and would have set them at one again, that he settled the quarrel between them. And separate them so that they will not strive or fight. Saying, sirs, ye are brethren. Why do ye wrong one to another? Remember that. Sirs, ye are brethren. And we who are children of the same father in heaven. Sirs, ye are brethren. Husband and wife, you are children of God together. Sirs, ye are brethren. Remember that we who know the Lord. We who are born again. We who are bought by the same blood of the Lamb. Ye are brethren. How should brethren, why should brethren do wrong one to another? That's what Moses said. But he that did his neighbor wrong, thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Would thou kill me? As thou did the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses fled at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, he appeared, they, they appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Now you realize that at this time, when what happened, happened. That Moses was now forty years of age in the court of Pharaoh. And he thought it was time for action. Isn't that the way we think sometimes? Oh, many people will tell us, a fool at 40 is a fool forever. If you say God is calling you, if you say God wants you to do something, 
If you say that God wants to use you as a deliverer of his people, you are at the age of 40. You don't arise and act whether you hear the voice of God or not, telling you this is the time. If you don't arise and do something now, a fool at 40 is a fool forever. And because of this, many people will take a wrong step. The injustices that were being heaped upon the Israelites gave Moses great concern. Human reasoning, unguided zeal, and perceived call would all have influenced him to act the way he did. He knew that these people should not have been unjustly treated like this. Because of this, he felt something must be done and must be done now. Not only that, unguided zeal. This man was energetic. And was very mighty. He knew the words, he knew the deeds, he knew what to do. That's what he thought. Not only that, he perceived the call of God. That's what we read in Acts chapter 7 in verse 25. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his son would deliver them. But they understood not. Doesn't that sometimes happen in the church? You've got revelation. You've got dream. You perceive the call of God. God wants you to be a preacher, to be an evangelist, to be a pastor, to be a missionary, to be a full-time worker. You know the call, but the church around you does not perceive that call. Moses knew that call, but the people of Israel did not know, did not understand, did not perceive the call of God upon his life. He knew, but he did not know. He understood, but he did not understand. When it happens like that, what are we to do? Are we to jump up and run out and say, whether the church understands it or not, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. No, not at all. That is what landed Moses into trouble. He had no authority at that time from Egypt to correct any of those ills, any of those evils. And God had not yet commissioned him for public ministry. He felt the call to deliver Israel. And he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his son would deliver them, but he understood not. He was impatient. And he acted prematurely. He acted on his own, and he got into trouble. A self-appointed leader who is not willing to wait for God's time and not patient enough to receive instruction and commission from the higher authority that is from God cannot be used of God until he learns to wait. Until he learns to wait. Now let's look at this. There are some good, good, wonderful qualities in the life of Moses. And yet I'm showing you this to tell you something. Even though he had all these talents and all these gifts and all these wonderful qualities of life, impatience spoiled everything. Learn that lesson for your own life. In Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 24. Hebrews 11 from verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Now you will see here that we have the gifts and the talents of Moses. Not only that, his qualities of life. Now we are told various things. Let us uh, listen to this. We are told that Moses was learned in the wisdom of Egypt. That's one thing. Not only that, he was mighty in words and in deeds. That's two. Number three, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Maybe you don't understand that. There is a man, an historian. His name, Josephus. He was a Jewish historian. And this Jewish historian has told us, has informed us, that Pharaoh, that is the Pharaoh on the throne, he had no son. He had just this only daughter. And in the system of Egypt at that time, this lady could not train as a queen over Egypt. And she herself, she had no son. And so in adopting Moses, Moses was her only son. And their law permitted that the adopted son could now reign. And so Moses was now confronted with the choice. You could, you could get into the palace. You could now be the official adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. 
And since there was no other person to reign, now it could come to you and you could reign. And by the age of 40, this other Pharaoh had not died yet. And therefore, when that Pharaoh eventually died, Moses would be much more than 40 years of age and he could reign. But then when they gave him that offer, the Bible says he refused. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That means he refused wealth, honors, power, and the throne. Then not only that, this will be number four, he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. That suffering was not forced upon him, but he voluntarily chose to suffer for the ministry of deliverance for the children of Israel. He preferred hardship to comfort, shame rather than fame, reproach rather than honor, affliction rather than pleasure. Number five, he had his eyes on the invisible, not on the tangible. He was occupied with the future of delivering the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. He wanted the future rather than the present. Yet, listen to this, with all those good qualities, education, mighty in words and in deeds, much wisdom, much self-denial, much consecration, and a willingness to suffer, the self-denial with all those sp spiritual qualities, impatience led him to premature action. That led him to shattered hope and to isolation and to the delay of his ministry. Beware of impatience. You see, it may be that you are impatient in your employment. You are employed as at now. But then in that place of work, you feel that uh, you should have got promotion looking at your education looking at the value and the quality of your certificate, looking at your hard work and industry in that place of work, looking at the other people that are getting promoted and you have not been promoted, you feel that I am qualified for this, and impatiently you resign and you say, I will look for another job. And that might even land you into another shattered hope, that premature action. Beware of impatience. It may be that you want to get married. And as you want to get married, you think you are sure of the will of God. Already you have a good job at hand. You have a good accommodation. And you feel that looking at it materially, looking at it educationally, looking at it spiritually, I think this is the time I should get married. And then instead of praying to know the will of God, and then praying and waiting patiently so that you will go through every step as a child of God. I'm not only talking to workers, I'm talking to all members in the church. There are some workers that there are some people that feel that only workers are to regulate their marriage according to the word of God. That is erroneous teaching. You as a child of God, maybe you are qualified educationally, materially, socially, and spiritually. You think everything is all right, I should get married now. Remember, impatience can spoil the whole thing. Or maybe you are married already, you have a family. A child has not come. And you have checked up medically. And the doctor has told you that there's nothing wrong with you in particular. Maybe the problem is with your husband. Maybe if you are the husband and you are all right, maybe the problem is with your wife. And you say that everything is okay with me. Everything is all right with my body. And there is no reason why I should not have got children by now. Beware of impatience. It may be in your business. You are selling. You are doing some uh, things in the market. And then you are telling yourself, I know that I should have got this, I should have got this. And because you are so impatient, because of the gain that has not come, you hurry out of that business or want to jump on a, another thing. Or maybe you are with a particular business partner. You think that with all my intelligence, with my running up and down, with all the contacts I have, I know that if I were alone by myself, this is what I can achieve. Beware of impatience. It may be you are here in the church. And you look around, you see that all these other people are there, and yet you know your education. You know, your, you know the way you are wise in speaking. You are mighty in words, you are mighty in prayer, you are mighty in deeds. It may be you have qualities in your life of self-denial, qualities of sacrifice, of discipline, of love, of, of bearing the cross and following Christ. You have the quality that you don't, you don't even care for pleasure, you don't care for luxury, you don't care for convenience. And you tell other people, you say, what is the church waiting for? If they are looking for education, I've got it. If they are looking for courage, I've got it. If they are looking for faith, I've got it. 
if they are looking for the ability to preach in wisdom, I've got it. If they are looking at organization, I've got it. If they are looking for other qualities like self-denial, I'm not, I'm not even looking for money. I'm not saying that if I become full-time, they should pay me this amount or that amount. I'm willing to suffer affliction. Why is it they have not recognized my call? I've almost resigned my job. Or I've given up my job. I've even told my employers, I've told them that any time from now, I can be called into the ministry. What is the church waiting for? Beware of impatience. That is what Moses got into. And because of that, he went into this premature action. And it eventually landed him in Midian. Instead of making him to stay with the people of God to continue to lead them. Moses was truly a, one, a wonderful character, endowed with great extraordinary gifts and talents. But he was in too big a hurry. He ran ahead of God. God's time had not yet come to deliver Israel, but Moses grew impatient and he acted in the energy of the flesh. That act of Moses was not at all in accord with the method with which God plan to employ to deliver the children of Israel. Impatience led him to sin, killing somebody, frustration, disappointment, and to suffering. Then he had to run away to Midian. Now let's look at part three of our study today. Forty years separation from God's people. Exodus chapter two Reading from verse 15. Exodus chapter 2. Reading from verse 15. Now when Pharaoh had this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian and he sat down by a well. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters. And they came and drew water and filled their troughs to water their father's flock. Let's understand. These were ladies, seven of them. There was unity in that family, that the seven daughters were occupied with the same kind of business, taking care of their father's flock. What a wonderful thing if daughters of God will take a lesson from this. If the daughters of a Midianite can be so united, no fighting, no quarreling, no gossip, no separation, no discord, and no disharmony among them. What a challenge for us who are daughters in the kingdom of God. That there should be unity. There should be harmony. We should be able to walk together as daughters of God. Let's learn a lesson from there. And the shepherds, verse 17, came and drove them away. And Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. Here is Moses again. He helped these daughters. In a strange land, what had been implanted in him to help, that was still there. The shepherds, the men, that would have hindered these seven daughters from taking the water in time and watering the flock, now could not do it because Moses helped those daughters. And he helped them without even thinking there was going to be any reward for what he did. That's why the Bible says, uh, you plant all your seed and you throw it upon many waters because you do not know which one will bear fruit. Verse 18. And when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that she comes so soon today? And they said, And the Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and watered the floor. Here when they got back home, the father asked them, Oh, it's very quick today, so fast today. How are you able to make it in good time today? And they said, An Egyptian helped us. Was Moses an Egyptian? No. Did he have the heart of an Egyptian? No. Has he not refused to even be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter? Oh yes. Who was he? He was an Israelite so eager, so consumed with the desire to, de to deliver the children of Israel. But then they called him an Egyptian. They attributed the help that he gave. They attributed it to the good nature of an Egyptian. The reason they called him him an Egyptian was because of his dressing and appearance. An Israelite indeed, yet he was mistaken to be an Egyptian. We should be very careful that after our conversion, we do not keep an Egyptian look. 
You know, there are some people, they are born again, but when you look at them with all this beard upon them, and they are so wild, like the people of the world, you will not know, you will mistake them for an Egyptian, for a person of the world. Sometimes you will see a man with his hair so bushy, although he's born again, but he doesn't know that they are mistaking him to be an Egyptian, a person of the world. If we are born again, let us make sure that our outward department or comportment, our outward appearance does not look like that of the people of the world. Sometimes it is that you will find a person is born again, real child of God, but his fingernails are longer than that of the eagle. You see, we should be very careful that our look, our fingernails, or whatever it is, does not look like that of the Egyptian. And the same thing with our sisters. You see, sisters, here is where we need to be very careful that we do not, now you have been born again, now you are a child of God, you will not be painting like those people of the world, stretching your ear and uh, palming like those uh, people of the world, or painting your fingernails like those of the world, or using their cosmetics and their jewelry and all those things like the people of the world. Don't let them mistake you for an Egyptian. When you know that at heart, you are an Israelite indeed. You are a real child of God. And all the, all the perfumes and all the things they're using, you will not be using all those things that when you come near, people will look at you and they will say, which Egyptian is so close by like this that is, uh, you know, smelling with all these odors and all the smell of the Egyptian. Avoid Egyptian look. Avoid Egyptian appearance. Avoid Egyptian dressing. Moses was ready to help these daughters. Even though she, he had been trained as in Egypt, the Egyptians hated the shepherds. But then Moses was not like that. He had learned in Egypt, but then he had not learned to despise and to hate the shepherds like the Egyptians did. And so he helped them. Let's now go to verse 21. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter, and she bare him a son. And he called his name Gershom, for he said, I've been a stranger in a strange land. Eventually, Moses, he perhaps never felt that he would be able to go back to Egypt again to deliver the children of Israel. He felt, perhaps, let me settle down now and get married. If he had not taken the premature action he took, perhaps he would not have married a Midianite. You see, this wife he married eventually was not a great encouragement to his later ministry. Let us beware of impatience. The scars of the wounds caused by impatience often remain with perpetual pain. And so you discover that in the life of this man Moses, that the marriage eventually uh, did not actually encourage his ministry. In fact, he had a problem or two because of that marriage. But remember that marriage took place because he had fled away to Midian, and all he could do now is that he was over there. Moses became a stranger in the land of Midian. It's a, that action of impatience separated him from his mother and his father. And he loved that mother, loved that father very much. Those were parents of faith, yet he had to be separated from them. And he was separated from Miriam and Aaron and all other Israelites for 40 years. I'm not sure that the mother was still alive by the time he came back after 40 years because you see after he came back he would not be 80 years of age himself at that time. And even Miriam will be more than 90 years of age by that time. And you think of the parents then. Oh, the parents would have perhaps have died. That premature action that separated him now from Egypt, separated him from the father, from the mother, from Miriam, from Aaron, and from all the other Israelites that he cared about so much. While Moses was in Midian, he suppressed people. In Egypt, continued under the crushing weight of their bodies. God still watched over the covenant with Abraham. He even still watched over the call of Moses and the preservation and protection of Israel, but the deliverance of Israel had to wait until Moses was ready. Moses needed the schooling, the instruction, the training, the discipline of God. And Israel's desire for freedom also needed to grow. Let's uh, look at the concluding verses of that chapter. In verse 23, And it came to pass, in the process of time, that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed, 
by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. The king of Egypt died. Yes, that's it. It's appointed unto men. Wants to die. After this, the judgment. Don't be afraid. Pharaohs die. Herods die. Nebuchadnezzar die. And don't think that your persecution, your problem is going to continue forever. And then the children of Israel, they began to cry unto the Lord by reason of the bondage. And God had their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and had respect unto them. The children of Israel cried unto God for deliverance. God had their groaning. God remembered his covenant. And God looked upon the children of Israel. God's time of deliverance was getting near. And the confirmation of the call of Moses was now soon to come. God's time is the best. We have learned a lot of blessings today. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for God's time of deliverance and commissioning. It's now time to pray and get together all that we have learned. And as we see all these things that we have learned, we need to pray. So that this problem of impatience that is so common among people will not destroy us, will not delay the call of God in our lives, and will not leave permanent scars that are very painful upon our lives. Rise up and let us talk to God in prayer. Rise up now and let us talk to God in prayer. Bring all these lessons we have learned, bring it to the Lord in prayer. The faith of the parents of Moses, the way God ordered all the details so that the will of God was still done, the fact that no counsel will stand against the Lord, even though there are many devices in the hearts of wicked men, and the fact that God's will will still be done. In your family stay with God's will. In your business stay with God's will. In the church let's stay with God's will. And let us remain in faith, whatever edict, whatever decree, whatever commandment, whatever the condition of the nation, don't be afraid, don't be worried, don't be anxious, stay with God's will. We plant a big blessing on the, on the danger of impatience, impatience among the youth, impatience among elderly people, impatience among leaders, workers in the church. Impatience among the people that say they feel and they know the call of God in their lives. Impatience among members in the church. Impatience among family members. Let's pray that impatience will not ruin us. We need to wait for God's time. Wait for God's appointment. And do God's work in God's own way.